Hello, everybody. Good evening. We are about to start our telephone town, no, virtual town hall for the 33rd district. And with us are Senator Karen Kaiser and Representatives Tina Orwell and Mia Gregerson. So here's the thing. Um, when we sent out the invite, we also included a link to collect questions. And so many of you sent um, your questions in ahead of time. And so we're going to be using some of those. But if you have a question that you want to ask, please uh, make sure you put it in the comments of whichever platform you are watching this. And let's get started with opening remarks from here. I think she froze, but I want to thank Lily for hosting and moderating this town hall. And I want to thank all of you for joining Tina and Mia and I, as we talk about the session we just got out of on March 10th, the 2022 legislative session. And I'll tell you, it was um, for the fifth year in a row, a session where we got out on time with a balanced budget. And we haven't done that since 1899. So we set a record almost over a hundred years ago uh, when we uh, had five years in a row with a balanced budget and uh, on time adjournment, signy die, we call it. So we had a very intense, very, very fast and very productive session. And we want to talk with you about your questions and find out what's on your mind as we um, give you what, um, what uh, we can in terms of what we got accomplished. So with that, I turn it over to my colleagues, Representative Orwell. Thank you, Senator Kaiser. And it's an honor to be here and to serve our community and uh, wanna thank my seatmates and all the staff. You know, these have been very intense times and we've had a lot of challenges. Families are struggling, businesses. Um, so we had a lot of work to do in Olympia. And I just wanna really acknowledge it was a very different session you know, we had to do a lot on Zoom and I really appreciate all the staff that really made that possible. One of the things that came out of that is we had a lot more participation. We had record numbers of people signing into committees and sending feedback. And so that was really a positive part of the session. <clears throat> so some of the issues I work on, and I don't know what's going on with my voice, sorry, um, is I do a lot around public safety. I serve on the public safety committee I also do a lot on behavioral health, and uh, we're in this very unique moment where we're rethinking our crisis services with the 988 starting, and I've uh, been doing a lot of work in the community on this. And I also do a lot around K-12, uh, working a lot on, again, supporting our students who are struggling right now with the pandemic. And we also have been looking at language access and apprenticeships and all the things we can do to make sure students have a path to be successful. So I look forward to your questions tonight. Uh, again, it's an honor to be here and I will pass it off to my seatmate, Representative Gregerson. Thank you, Tina. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all the staff that helped put this together, whether it was the, the newsletter that talked about the announcement or the collection of the questions. Um, staff has really taken the brunt of so many questions and uh, uh, keeping up on the many meetings that we've had over the last few years during COVID. And I just want to say thank you and, and recognize that everything that we do really has so much support of, of staff behind the scenes. Um, I guess what I'd like to say in my opening remarks is that your, your comments and your concerns over the last few years have been heard. We've really tried to use the budget and the meeting space to really deliberate and think um, creatively around how to use the federal dollars in a way that uh, we continue to be in partnership with communities, communities of color, uh, businesses, trusted messengers, and those that are the farthest from recovery. We know that everyone's feeling the pressure of inflation and some things that we have no control over, but there are things that we do have control over. And I'm hopeful that tonight during our town hall, We'll be able to talk about some of those things that um, we've really tried to put together, both be being creative and new approach, but also recognizing that we need to stay committed to some of the, the things that we've been working on for many, many years. COVID has made it so that we're going to have to uh, recover, uh, recover by helping those that need us the most. And um, I'm looking forward to talking about those investments tonight. Thanks. All right. Thank you. 
So hopefully this is going to work out. I think my internet might be a little wonky, but um, so if you can't hear me, I'm sorry. I'm going to do my best. We have our first question from Ahmed and Ahmed asks, how are you making housing more affordable? That is an excellent question. I will jump in first. Um, we have a housing crisis and it really is on every level of housing, whether people are trying to purchase homes, uh, rentals, uh, you know, we have people struggling to stay in their homes and we're just seeing the price of housing and rent just skyrocketing. And so that is an excellent question. And one of the things we really did this year, which I'm really proud of, is there's record investments in our housing trust fund, which is a really important source to build more housing. We also have been looking at what's called transit orient developments. You know, we have the light rail coming and really is an opportunity to build a lot more housing around these areas. And so a lot of us and I've been working with community leaders on looking at how do we create more workforce housing? Uh, there's a whole committee looking in South King County around home ownership. So again, we're trying to do those investments of supporting the agencies that actually do the development, as well as putting new dollars in both for, again, developing new housing, as well as rental assistance, both to um, tenants and to landlords. I also do a lot of work on um, foreclosure prevention. We also wanna keep people in their homes that might be struggling right now. So really proud we put more money into counseling and to mediation to help on that. In fact, our budget, and I know Mia can talk about this more, we put more than a half billion dollars into affordable housing. And this is a huge, this is a short budget, uh, it's called a supplemental budget. And it's a huge amount of money for us to invest with our housing trust fund and our other housing agencies in our communities. It's aimed at preventing uh, families that are at risk of becoming homeless from becoming homeless, and also for providing rapid rehousing for those who are ho homeless. And also um, we provided something like almost $50 million for rental assistance, because as you know, during the pandemic, we had so much dislocation. Um, so a lot of um, rents were, were frozen and this rental assistance will help landlords recover some of their lost revenues and not shut down apartments. What we need is housing. And we are building housing. If you've gone around our district lately, you've noticed that huge housing development uh, near the uh, Tukwila uh, Sound Transit station, light rail station on Pacific Highway. There's another two or three other very large apartment buildings being built in our district, even as we speak. Uh, to, to follow up and to support some of the work that uh, my seatmates have talked about, I think it's on us to recognize that the eviction moratorium has ended. And with that comes a bow wave of many, many evictions. And so um, we did use some federal dollars to help with that. But we also know that keeping uh, people in their jobs, so job, uh, a worker restoration and continuing to keep people doing the hard work. So we invested $55 million towards stipends to help workers stay uh, in the field to help folks that are uh, homeless and ha have housing crisis. We also invested in probably the Senator will talk about the difficult to discharge out of our hospitals and where do they go? And so there are so many wraparound support mechanisms that really deal with the housing crisis, not just building of the housing. Um, because we weren't able to pass the policy bill around um, uh, comprehensive planning and the middle uh, missing middle, we did invest many millions of dollars to help partner with local government so that they could use our comprehensive planning to do better around uh, building more affordable housing. I think the last thing I want to talk about is uh, we have the most number of mobile home parks that are scheduled to close this coming year. And uh, with that comes technical assistance. Uh, it's very difficult to move entire communities of people uh, from where they own a home. And so we have been thoughtful about that. There's a couple million dollars in the capital budget for that purpose. Uh, and so, go, and then the last I actually really want to say is utility assistance. We know that uh, the ability, so we have 100 million in utility assistance and 50 million in broadband assistance to help the arrears uh, for both uh, low income folks and some businesses. All right. Thank you. We have a second question. This one is from Priya. 
Public transport can be made easily accessible to the public without having to drive in order to reach a park and ride. What are you doing to support transit? Well, again, it's always um, comes down to money. And in this case, our um, transportation package did increase our investment in King County Metro, which is our basic background backbone bus service. Um, I believe it's almost a half billion dollars for that as well. So we will have more bus service to um, our transit hubs and um, the, um, the problem in the suburbs is we don't have the level of density that supports really efficient mass transit. So that's another reason why we are building these affordable housing um, developments to make sure that we have the ability to move people to where they need to go without having to get on those congested freeways. Because, you know, during the pandemic, people stopped driving, but boy, it seems like everybody's driving now and they're all driving like maniacs. So <laughs> it seems like to me that people are driving way too fast and way too reckless. And that's maybe part of some of our behavioral health issues that we're all facing after two years of this COVID pandemic. I, I'm really proud of um, I, I'm really proud of our transportation committees. They held over 90 listening sessions around the state, and really put a package together of 16 billion dollars over 16 years. And in that, um, continues to invest in our Climate Commitment Act. And you'll see uh, when it comes to transit and making it more affordable, we invest um, millions and billions of dollars towards um, 3.1 billion in transit and 50 million in walking and biking projects. Uh, we continue to connect communities. We know that means being able to safely connect. We make uh, transit, I think, free for, for students um, under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. um, some real game changers. Now in the operating budget, we also invest uh, over $100 million towards electric uh, vehicles, electric bicycles, uh, doing the grant programming that require that is required for overburdened communities. We know that through that is our communities um, and so many in the suburbs. And so by prioritizing those communities, I do feel like we're going to see some of those investments earlier. Yeah. All right. So we have a third question. I don't know who one is from, but um, let's read it. We, um, oh, it's Melissa, sorry. 16 billion in transportation funds. What is shovel ready in the SeaTac neighborhood? I'm not exactly sure shovel ready, but as you know, the big project to connect 509 into uh, I-5 and, and 167 is um, on this budget. We are funding the, the leg that needs to be completed to connect the dots between I-5 and 509 and 167. Um, that is something that we've supported and encouraged because so much of the heavy truck traffic on I-5 going up the hill at SeaTac creates huge huge back backlogs of uh, traffic congestion. And if the trucks can go on 509 from the port of Seattle to the Kent Valley or to Tacoma or wherever, where, uh, by getting around that hill and around the I-5 backup, it'll be much more efficient. Now we don't have everything we want, but we did get a big chunk of change for that particular project. And I think we also got a large um, appropriation to finish the gateway project, um, which is the continuation of the 167 improvement. The operating budget uh, transferred $2 billion from the operating budget to the transportation budget. And with that was some of the caveat that the Senate, the good Senator talked about when it came to the gateway project. The transportation budget was actually one of the budgets that was gutted the most during the pandemic that really uh, felt the biggest pain point when it came to uh, the estimates of revenue to help support the project. So that's why we transferred such a large amount out of the operating budget to help make uh, things whole. And that definitely is in the SeaTac neighborhood where people come through our community but don't stay. And so we want to help get them do that without too much congestion. 
The other thing that was exciting about the transportation budget was dollars around siting of another airport. And I do want to do a shout out. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been partnering with uh, uh, Senator Kaiser on a committee she started, which is looking at another location in our state. And again, um, I know you worked hard on the Senate side, uh, Senator, for this. Mm -hmm. And it's just really important. We know this airport has such an enormous impact on our community. And so as we're trying to look at these new locations, you know, our hope is that they can find one that isn't smack in a residential area like we are, uh, that has such a great impact on SeaTac and the surrounding areas. So again, I this, I know this was a big team effort from the 33rd, but again, it's another step forward. And Senator, I don't know if you want to comment on that as well. It's a big step forward. And we also got $10 million to invest in development of biofuels for jets. And that will reduce air pollution. And we're concerned about the air pollution from the jet fuel being burned over our heads. So that's another um, important step forward in terms of aviation and our community, because we are not going to, SeaTac's not going to go away, SeaTac Airport. It's going to continue to operate. So we want it to operate in as clean and as um, pollution-free way as possible. All right. Our fourth question is from Colleen. Are you doing anything about catalytic converter theft? Oh, thank okay. you for that question. Um, I serve on public safety, and this was a big topic. And I need to do a shout out to Representative Ryu, who's from the 32nd District, who really took the lead for us. Uh, I did end up teaming up with her so we could get her bill amended and kind of uh, sent along the way. But I really appreciate she really has done a comprehensive job working with law enforcement and uh, you know, dealers and just really bringing everyone to the table that needs to be part of these solutions. So they're going to come up with a series of recommendations, but they're already looking at data that we can do better collection of information of what's going on. And, you know, there's um, things about having numbers on, on these converters so that they can actually be tracked and people won't be able to readily sell them in other areas. So I know Representative Ryu did a great job. I was very happy we got that one handed to the governor, and I think that's going to give us some really important next steps. And uh, I know it's it's impacted our community, and I've heard from a lot of our neighbors. And uh, it's it's very overwhelming. It can damage the car. It's very costly, and so I'm really proud we got some next steps here. Okay, our next question is from Stuart. State spending has gone up 50% while population has gone up 6% in the past few years. What happens if the revenue projections turn out to be overly optimistic? What will be the first cut or what taxes will go up? I just want to mention that we passed a balanced budget uh, with no uh, major tax increases and some tax cuts. We also put a huge amount of money in our reserves in our what we call our rainy day fund and other savings accounts by having the kind of financial discipline that we've had over the last five years our state budget has earned the first ever triple a moody's bond rating we're usually happy to get double a triple a is absolutely fantastic that means our interest rate for debt will be very very low and that's a wonderful thing so i want you to be reassured that we have and mia knows the numbers better than i do but we have put a significant amount of money away in reserve funds and in rainy day funds to be there if there's another crisis and we have no idea what that crisis will be whether it's another covid um mutation that creates havoc or whether the international um, conflagration that's going on in in europe right now spreads we don't know so we are conservative in terms of our budget and it's going to be um i think very stable for several years because of what we've done um, but even when we've done that our state is ranked number one by us news as uh, the best state to live in. And that's two years in the last two, uh, two, two years in a row that we've got a number one ranking. That's from US News and World Report. And Oxfam has ranked our state as number one for working people in the country. So I'm 
thinking we're in better shape than a lot of people understand. And I'll, I know Mia has a lot more detail about our budgets. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. And I'll try to be brief because it can get really wonky and actually <laughs> boring. A lot of times when we do the budget deliberation, we don't actually do it by a population number. We really do it by need. We do it by listening to what policy is being deliberated and really uh, uh, make sure we fund that. As you can imagine, if you pass a bill, a policy bill, but you don't put any money to it, it doesn't really help Washingtonians uh, around the state. And um, the health of our budget is, is, is extreme. We're at basically at levels pre-pandemic when it comes, as uh, the Senator talked about, when it comes amount in our reserves. We um, also um, have spent $5.6 billion. Some of that spending is one-time dollars. Again, as you know, there are large federal packages that have come our way and uh, it was on, upon us to really be smart and make sure we use those dollars towards recovery and dealing with the pandemic, but not investing in ongoing investments. And so that's where you're seeing huge um, swaths of dollars, as we talked about, whether it's rental assistance, utility assistance, business assistance, those are all um, food assistance. That's all related uh, back to one-time federal dollars. Okay. Um, hopefully people can hear me. This thing is telling me that my internet is not stable. Okay. People can hear me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I, I mean, not stable. Okay. Um, Mike has a question. What are you doing to address homelessness? Well, thank you, Mike, for that question. And it, it has been a priority um, for my colleagues in Olympia. And I'm really proud of the work we've done this session. Um, Representative Chop, I thought, had a very compelling bill, which really said um, housing is part of health care. You know, there's so many people living on the streets that are struggling with mental health, um, addiction and other issues. And we know these housing models like Housing First that rapidly move people into housing and then they surround them by services are very effective and they're, they're cost effective and they're humane. Right. They're the right thing to do. So we, we are recognizing that we're doing record investments. We're trying to invest in the models that are shown to be effective. And as you look at our housing trust fund, a lot of those go to what's considered 30% AMI, which is very low income house housing, which creates the kind of housing we need to really transition people off the street. And again, it's not just about housing, right? It's about services and community and helping them be successful. So. Again, it, it was a huge priority and uh, really glad that we're, we're taking some important steps. I think, oh, um, I, I think it's important for us. Oh. I, I just wanna um, use a no, little please, bit more go ahead. time, if that's okay. We invested in wages uh, in this budget. Some of the, uh, the workers that are serving the most vulnerable, whether it's people staying in their home longer as they need caretakers as they age. We know we have a silver tsunami coming our way. It's already here. And we need to make sure that people that are working in those spaces can live with dignity. I'm very proud to say that we raised those wages to 20 and $25, depending where they are. I know the Senator can talk also about the investments in our DD and our long-term community. Washington state is known for being committed to taking care of our people where they are and keeping them in the community if we can. Um, that is part of our approach to dealing with homelessness. And I'll be the first to say we aren't going far enough and we have more to do. Um, and we need some good local government partners to do this work. We cannot do this as just a state. Um, the politics aren't there. The political will isn't there. We need partners. So I'm hopeful that as we all um, make homelessness um, one of our top priorities, we're willing to really roll our sleeves up and, and do that harder, more deeper work. And just to say, we have to grapple with uh, what's called NIMBYism, uh, the not in my backyard kind of attitude that some neighborhoods have about bringing in um, affordable housing into the region. We need to have housing for everybody to have a healthy community. So if we don't provide the housing in their communities, then the whole community gets a little sicker and a little less secure. So um, it's important that we have these conversations, make sure that the, the appropriate kinds of housing and sizes 
and availability of services are also part of the package. And I will just add one little thing. Um, having the supported housing, which is where you have, what I call it is you've got to have a mom on site who reminds you to get to your doctor's appointment or reminds you to take your medications and is just looking out for your well-being. Having those kind of supportive services also comes with some federal dollars because we can access Medicaid matching funds for a lot of those services. So it's a really good deal for our communities and for our budget. Okay, now we're going to Denise. How is funding for education going to support teachers as well as students who've had a hard time with virtual learning? Well, another piece of our budget was uh, some significant funding for um, counseling and uh, nurses on uh, in our in our schools. We have over the years seen too many schools cut back on counseling and cut back on having nurses available. And so many of our students have the same problem most adults have, which is we've been under lockdown and in masks and really restricted for a couple of years now. And they ha it has had some real impacts on mental health and on stability and on learning. So we need to address those impacts and to make good on people who are in our schools and need to be able to socialize and learn and achieve like they would have if they didn't have a pandemic. The other thing is we did also provide some supplemental funding. And Mia, again, is our budget um, expert on this, uh, but it's some of the schools lost students when they started learning at home. Some of the school districts actually had a drop in their student population, not so much in our school districts, in our district, in our area. But Seattle had a huge drop, for instance, of how many students are in the Seattle public schools. So we did some back filling for funding for, I guess you call them ghost students. They'll probably show up one of these days but we don't know quite where they are. Yeah, I was gonna say, I just, um, I just think that children and uh, our children have been so hard hit by the pandemic and we already have a high number of um, suicides of young adults in our state. And so it just, it just really breaks my heart to see this pandemic having even more of an impact. And so, the 70 million that we invested to add more counselors and psychologists and social workers to the schools is so important. And we need to support our teachers. This has been very stressful on the staff as well. And so uh, again, I know when I went to my teachers, including my daughter, who's a first year teacher in Highline, they kept saying, what are you doing around mental health? And so I really do believe this is a first uh, good first step. And we did, um, I know our school districts, I think they're, you know, they are impacted by the lower enrollment numbers and we're trying to at least on a short term basis help them with that. But, you know, it's it's a big transition for families. And I I'm worried about the students that fell behind the most. And so one of the things I worked on this year was language access for the K-12 system. Um, this is especially important um, for parents. Maybe we don't speak English where English is not their first language because it's so important that parents are involved in their kids' education, right? That's how students are successful. So again, um, students that maybe have special needs that have intellectual or developmental disabilities were very hard hit. And I think we need to, in our schools, really support um, their transition back from virtual learning. And really, again, I think the social emotional is the most important part uh, I know people are worried about catching up ap academically, and I know we'll take that on, but I, I just think really making sure they feel reconnected in schools is so important. I'd like to add, because education, K through 12 education is such a big part of the work that we do. Um, we also invested in um, making sure that every student was gonna get a school lunch, and we call it universal school lunch program. Um, we also made sure that our capital budget worked in partnership with uh, ensuring that the facilities, the water quality, the seismic uh, quality of the facilities is actually whole and healthy. Um, I think we invest uh, millions of dollars towards changing out lighting 
and I think air quality. So um, I want to just pay recognition that we really think about the detail of what the experience for each of our children and families and staff are. Um, one of the things that we fought for was to make sure that as the cuts um, to the, the investments of the counselors, um, that they that did not happen to Title I schools, the low-income schools. We want to make sure that we continued on the trajectory that was necessary for our most vulnerable schools. Um, I feel very proud of, of that work. We also continue to expand ECAP into um, summer months, um, and we invest heavily in working ch child uh, care, connection care, sorry, WCCC, uh, to ensure that our kiddos right before and after school have a place to go. Um, the staff is there ready to help support so our parents can go back to work. <laughs> and I just wanna add one of my favorite bills past this last session was expanding statewide the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. This is such a cool program. Dolly Parton is such an incredibly generous person. She has a program where they mail books to kids in their home for free and uh, kids who are five years older or less, I guess. And it encourages kids who aren't actually in classrooms yet to start reading and to start becoming um, book learning, as, as Dolly would say. And it's an incredible gift and an incredible program. And it's in a few other states, and now Washington State has it too. All right. So we are just slightly over the halfway point. Everybody is doing very well. Thank you very much. So next, we have a question from Miguel. Prices of food, medicine, gas are getting higher. What are you doing to stop that? Well, I don't think we have the power to stop inflation. Inflation is a problem. I want to totally acknowledge it is a problem for all kinds of ways and all kinds of people and all kinds of families. But we cannot unilaterally in our state legislature end it but we can try to mitigate the impacts. And that's what we did with the budget and by providing services and providing the funding for services that people need. And um, so by encouraging economic growth, we uh, in fact cut uh, the business and occupation tax that small businesses pay to zero. So 126,000 small businesses in our state will no longer pay a dime in state B&O taxes. And by reducing some burdens and by providing more services where we can, uh, that's a, a, a way to stabilize our economy. But it's way beyond our control. The price of oil, as you know, is very volatile. It was down around $35 a barrel. It went up to $135 a barrel. And now it's under $100 a barrel. You see the gas prices going up within hours of the increase in oil. You don't see gas prices going down when the oil prices go down. You see them you know, decline a penny or two. But it is frustrating that the prices people pay go up just immediately whenever there's an increase in cost. When there's a reduction in cost, not so much. And I think we need a little more consumer protection in place. And we'll be working with our attorney general because we do have a really good state consumer protection act to make sure that we aren't being gouged. There isn't price gouging going on uh, and really taking advantage of people because of supply chain problems, um, sort of in, um, instability problems in the in the economy. Not necessarily something we can control, but we can police it and do what we can to mitigate it. Yeah, one of the things I serve on finance and I'm really proud, I think it was Representative Ty on the House side had the Washington family um, tax credits um, that really allowed families that were struggling to get some rebates on their taxes. And again, that's money that they can used to buy food and other supplies. We also had, um, I think we did get this to the governor, which was around helping families with young kids and buying diapers and trying to not have sales tax on some of these things that again, are so expensive that are burdening families. And, um, you know, I, I think those were, were some of the things that we, we've done. And again, I think the hope is through rental assistance and, and 
other ways we're supporting um, around utility assistance, that those will provide some relief as families are experiencing increases in other areas. And if I could switch over to healthcare for a little bit, um, I passed two bills that may help in terms of the cost of healthcare. One is, is reducing the out-of-pocket cost for insulin from $100 a month to $35 a month. And the other is to create a prescription drug affordability board in our state. A few other states have begun this work as well. And what that board will do will identify up to 12 prescription drugs a year that are not the not at an affordable price. And they won't have they will have studied the issue and found out you know, that there's not any new costs in terms of providing the drug or new research in terms of the drug. It's a drug that's been around for a while, but there's just increasing prices. MS drugs are particularly egregious um, in this case. And it will be able to set an upper payment limit on up to 12 drugs a year. And to tell the, uh, the manufacturers of those drugs, we will pay this much, we won't pay more. So um, the bill is, is complicated, but I want you to know that it will bring down, I believe, it will push and pressure the drug manufacturers to reduce the price of prescription drugs in our state. I think, um, you know, inflation is one of those things that so many people are worried about. I think that's what bonds everyone together, regardless of party or <laughs> partisan politics. Um, and that's why you see in our budget uh, unfortunately, there are no Republicans that voted for the budget, but um, <laughs> that in our budget, we invest heavily in making sure that direct cash assistance when COVID started continues uh, for another year, whether it's um, 30,000 families on TANF, whether it's a senior meal program, uh, age blind and disabled, ensuring that the that the monthly supports there um, are in parity with TANF, which basically triples the amount of cash in hand. So those are other ways that we're dealing with inflation directly. Uh, while that doesn't fix the problems with inflation, it certainly helps to, to slow the, the downward spiral that families are facing every day. All right, we now have a question from Ishbel. I so appreciate all the support you've given to manufactured homeowners over the years. With the bill in House Rules, that's House Bill 1100, and one on the floor of the Senate, Senate Bill 5079, why did neither of these bills progress this session? So I'm not sure uh, the status of uh, 5079. It, um, it was sponsored by Senator Das, and it was a, a closure notice. And if it didn't pass this year, let me just say, these things will come back. They, they have a life, and, and they usually have some problem that needs to be addressed so we'll work on that in the interim because that's an important, as Mia mentioned earlier, we have a lot of mobile home parks that could close in our district. So we need to make sure that the people living in those mobile home parks get plenty of advanced notice so that they are not left in the lurch with really a, an impossible situation. So we'll be working on 5079 and I'll be working with Senator Doss in the Senate on that to make sure that we fix whatever was hanging it up and get it through next year. Yeah, and I think 1100 was the Durer bill around property taxes and manufactured homes. And I'm not sure why that one um, did not move. We actually, and I've, I've done one of the bills, but there's been several to try to give more property tax relief uh, to struggling um, homeowners. And I think uh, we did a great job and we forgot to include the manufacturer homes in a lot of those changes we made. So that bill was to address that. I do hope that's a bill we can get through next year. And uh, thank you, Ishbel, for all the work you do advocating for, for people in the mobile homes. Yeah, and uh, you know, HB 1100 okay. is not new to the legislature, uh, but it has um, a very um, uphill battle when it comes to first right to purchase. Um, 
landowners in our state are very, very powerful. And so we just need to continue to ask them to be at the table to, again, to come up with um, uh, a proposal that will work for both. It feels like we're very close that will allow the community that extra time to come together to be able to put that proposal together. Um, and, and I hear the property owners loud and clear that they want to make sure that they're able to reap several different types of tax benefits in order to give the community that extra time. And I think we can continue to work that out and um, ensure that there is some sort of element of opportunity for our uh, communities to rally together and be able to save their their uh, park if if it works out. As you know, Ishbel, we did put several millions of dollars in the budget to help work with communities to be able to have that technical assistance. So uh, we think that we're moving in the right direction. Thanks. Okay, our next question is from James. Hmm. Why are you continuing to restrict the right to bear arms? James, I am I am really amazed when I read the paper these days that shootings, mass shootings in particular, are no longer a big story. You don't see them on the front page. You see them in briefs, in little um, uh, sort of short notices that another three people were killed here and another 12 people were killed there and another 15-year-old was shot at school. and on and on and on. Our country, our state, our communities have way too many people being shot. And that is my concern. I think we have plenty of guns, personally. I think we have something like three guns for every person in the country in terms of gun ownership, private gun ownership. So I don't think it's a lack of the number of guns or I think what we have is a real crisis in the use of guns in places where they should not be used. For instance, at public um, school board meetings, uh, there's been a, a new kind of, I guess it's called brandishment, a new kind of behavior where people like to show off guns and use them to intimidate people. And this is being done in public meetings. And we did pass a bill to say, you can't do that. You can't try to scare your school board members because you've got a gun on your shoulder or on your hip and you want to show it off. So those kinds of behaviors really have to be addressed in our communities these days because people have a, almost a trigger, um, that's bad use of the term, but a very um, quick reaction these days and very angry reaction these days to so many little trifling and ang ang annoyances that mostly if in the past we would have just brushed off as just let it go but now people are pulling out guns and shooting somebody over it and i don't know if you've noticed but i mean the pot shots are pop shot <laughs> marijuana retail stores that we have in our communities are targeted right now by people going in with guns blazing there was a young man killed in in pierce county last night i believe at a retail uh uh, cannabis store. So these are the public safety issues I am worried about is the rampant gun violence that seems to be out of control. And I, I want to add to this and I, I really like how um, Karen talked about, about our focus is really around trying to tampen down people who are using guns to intimidate others. Um, what you see is a focus on areas that we can control, whether it's when you're going into a community gathering place like the Capitol, or whether you're going to vote in an elections office. And really that's what we're focusing on. You'll see this past year is ensuring that the use is not to intimidate um, and which has nothing to do with actual right to bear arms. We, we actually did not touch the laws when it comes to your right to bear arms. I just want to make it very clear that while we use terminology and potentially the vocabulary is different between us, I think that our intentions are very much the same as long as you feel like it's not about using it to intimidate others and make them feel scared in a, in a community gathering place. I think that's where our commitment is. Yeah, you know, and I appreciate the comments by my seatmates and the work that's been done. The, the one thing I will mention, a lot of 
people don't realize that 80% of all gun deaths are suicides. And so, you know, we've also really tried to have a strong focus on this. This is especially true for veterans that take their life by suicide. And so there's also been really important work. I'm really proud to work with the University of Washington, the Department of Veterans Affairs, really looking at lethal means and how we um, really have safe storage of firearms and uh, medications of people who might be at risk for suicide. So I think it's an important conversation, you know, um, again, is who's vulnerable and how do we protect people who might be at risk for, for gun violence? Okay, our next question is from Vicki. Washington has flourished economically to a large extent because of immigration. What is our state's stand on supporting immigrants? Well, I may jump in first. Uh, a bill I've worked on for five years that came from the Kent community is language access in the schools and it's to support immigrant families. And, you know, again, you know, I heard all these stories from families. I think in Kent, they have over 130 languages spoken in the Kent School District. It's beautifully diverse, but families maybe not feeling welcome or not part of their students' education, especially if they have uh, students with special needs. And so we're really able to help um, schools have the tools they need and best practices um, so that those um, services can be available in really training interpreters uh, when there's called an IEP, an individual um, education plan, and it's very technical. It's technical whether you have an MD or a social work degree, it's very difficult to navigate. And so it's especially important that we have trained interpreters that understand this and that really can be supporting families um, as they support their kids. So um, I also know we did a big investment in the budget and I mm -hmm. might turn it over to uh, Representative Gregerson to maybe talk about that. Well, I would like to mention that we have a couple of really wonderful um, nonprofits in our community, in our 33rd district community, uh, to support immigrants and refugees who come who come into our state. There's uh, Jewish Family Services down in the Kent Valley and Lutheran uh, Immigration Relief uh, in SeaTac, and um, both of those nonprofits are going to be receiving significant funding from Washington State's budget this year. I believe we sent them something like $75 million, not just those two, but the statewide refugee assistance programs. We don't operate state programs directly for refugees in itself, but we have these fantastic, many faith-based uh, refugee assistance programs uh, that are um, very, very active. They've been very active, of course, with the Afghan um, refugees that were fleeing from that awful war. And now, of course, we're looking at seeing if we'll be getting uh, refugees from U Ukraine as well. Uh, but we have, um, we have a pretty strong social network of refugee supports. And there's one thing I forgot to mention as well, and then I'll hand it over to Representative Gregerson, is that Open Doors, which is this wonderful agency in our community, really did leave the efforts on the K-12. And um, But they're also looking at a multicultural village in creating more housing and community centers and things that really are welcoming in our community and really proud to be supporting that work as well. Uh, well, I have to admit, I don't have the exact figures here in front of me for the amount of investment. It was a over a thousand page document <laughs> um, for for investments around language access. Uh, but what I can tell you is that we invested millions of dollars towards civil legal aid. Um, so many people need extra support and help. Domestic violence, um, farm workers. Um, for them to have a voice, uh, non Medicaid uh, investments. Um, uh, help for those that are, don't qualify for TANF um, to ensure that there are other uh, support mechanisms, uh, feeding assistance programs. So knowing that we have over 200,000 undocumented folks in our, in our state, we always have to think about that through the lens of equity and equity is investing more and more carefully in communities that need us. Um, if we continue to invest the way we always have, then we will always miss these communities. And so I, I do want to let you know that we are very committed uh, in investing in those spaces. Thanks. Okay. 
so we have about nine minutes left. We're going to try for a couple more questions. So let's hurry up and do this. Jackie is asking, why are hemp gummies and things like that being sold at gas stations? Isn't marijuana supposed to be regulated? Jackie, you are so right. I had two bills to regulate what's called cannabinoids. This is a chemical term about a, deriv a derivative of hemp. Our current law applies to cannabis, which is marijuana. Cannabis is not hemp. These hemp derived gummy bears and uh, vape pens and other um, uh, products that are not in the cannabis regulated system. That's called the I-502 because it was passed by initiative 502 system where we have retail stores. They are being sold at um, truck stops. They're being sold at tobacco stores. They're being sold at mini marts. Um, and it's a problem because some of these products, a lot of them, have, first of all, they have no oversight in terms of what chemicals are in there and what the health uh, aspects, aspects are. But secondly, some of them are intoxicating. So you have them being sold at places where, you know, people are on the road driving and they're chewing on these gummies and all of a sudden they're going to be totally impaired. And that means there'll be accidents. This is an awful thing. We had two bills. Neither of them could get all the way through. And it was so frustrating. We were working on the bill on the final night of session, still couldn't get it done. Um, so because some, unfortunately, some elements of the retail cannabis system don't want any regulation outside of their system, I guess. So two things, the Liquor and Cannabis Board today put out a notification that any any um, business selling these um, hemp derived gummies and other products that are chemically derived and intoxicating will be in danger of losing their license to sell liquor, beer and wine. The LCB can do that. They can they can take that license away. And that's a great profit center for a lot of mini marts and gas stations. So that should stop. I hope some of the um, proliferation here. Um, and the second, um, we're going to be having a, um, a, a two hour deep dive into this problem uh, in June uh, in the um, Senate um, Labor, Commerce and Tribal Affairs Committee, which is the, ch the committee I chair and the one that has authority over cannabis, liquor and all the vices. So, um, this is a, a public safety issue as far as I'm concerned, and I'm glad the LCB issued an emergency rule on liquor licenses just as a first step, but there's more work to be done. Okay, I seem to have lost the signal. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes? yes? No? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this might be our last question. And then after that, um, we will go to closing remarks. Jen asks, oh, I like this. Look, what bill or budget item are you most passing this session? It's hard to pick just one, I have to tell you. <laughs> I had a pretty good session. But I think my favorite bill was the apprenticeship bill. Uh, Senate Bill 5600. Apprenticeship is such an opportunity for all of our communities to get skills and a profession and a secure future. And, you know, the apprenticeship approach is to earn while you learn. That is, you earn a wage while you're working on the job and in the classroom to learn the profession. People mostly think that's only for people who want to be carpenters or electricians or something in the building trades. That's no longer true. So this bill, 5600, expands our apprenticeship programs to healthcare. We can, in healthcare, my, my daughter is in nursing school, so I know this. They have something called clinical hours in apprenticeship that's called on-the-job training. And in, um, in the um, healthcare field, we can do apprenticeship programs and we are starting doing apprenticeship programs for all kinds of health professions, including nurses. In um, high tech, 
we have a, a really successful uh, pioneering program in high technology that opens the door for women and veterans and underserved communities that don't necessarily think about going into coding. In um, public education, we have a program that we can have our classified staff employees in our school districts become certified teachers through an apprenticeship program. And we can do this and people can do this while staying in their current jobs and doing an apprenticeship uh, addition, in addition, or they can do an, an apprenticeship full time. And this is going to open so many doors for opportunity for tens of thousands of Washingtonians. Well, uh, my top bill was the language access bill. I've already talked quite a bit about it and you've heard about it. I'm so proud that it came from the community. They've been part of the whole process and they'll be part of implementing it to really make sure we have a strong partnership between our families and our schools. I do wanna mention, um, is that we were talking about and, and Senator Kaiser's bill on the apprenticeships is so incredible. I do want to mention that we have a program that we get funded in the budget and it's called, I'm calling it running start in the trade summer in the summer where juniors and seniors and young adults can attend um, the new program in Kent. And it was so popular last year that we've actually expanded it to more summers and doubled the size. Of the 24 students that went through it last year, 11 got into IBEW, which is mm -hmm. electricians, and everyone got placement. Some students started at like $40 an hour in these great professions. Mm -hmm. And so, again, there'll be two cohorts this summer and next summer. One will be at the Highline um, High School, and again, it'll be open to all the, the youth in South King County. So just really proud that we have this pathway for, for students to be successful, especially coming out of the pandemic and, and students trying to find that path. So very quickly, I'll just say that my favorite um, bill this year was really the Digital Equity Act. Um, and part of that is really our commitment as a state to ensure that as people are using the internet, they're able to navigate that safely. The state has invested uh, $49 million towards cybersecurity. We think about public safety in the sense of guns and, and stealing, you know, um, catalytic converters, but the reality is, is that cyber, uh, cyber security or having um, different um, uh, communities be attacked through viruses is really one of the biggest crimes that are right now. And so, keeping people safe from um, from that by learning literacy. So I'm very excited to watch that uh, continue to flourish, as in the 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 literacy skills. Thank you. <laughs> We only had a minute, so I want okay. to go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's see now. Um, we are closing this up. I am sorry that my internet has been so wonky today. This doesn't usually happen, but hopefully it went smoothly on the other side. We're going to go to very quick closing remarks. Um, and uh, to everybody who joined us this evening, thank you very, very much. If we couldn't get to your question, whether you posted it um, here in the comments or you sent it to us via the link, um, please be sure to, you know, connect with your with the legislators, you know, call their offices, send them emails, ask them. These three ladies are very good at responding. So let's start with the senator with closing. Well, before I close, I want to thank Lily. I want to thank um, I want to thank Ken. I want to thank Jennifer, uh, and I want to thank Molly in um, working as staff for this um, virtual town hall. Town halls always take a lot of staff time and a lot of effort, and I really, really appreciate their help. So um, in closing, the some of the best bills ever come to us from constituents. We talk to people in our meetings and in our everyday lives, in our communities, and we find ideas and we have questions to answer. And when we get the answer, we say, well, why not do it this way? And we're gonna continue, I'm sure, all three of us to listen and to bring those questions and those suggestions to Olympia to see what we can do to make our state even better. We had a, a short 60-day session, intense and exhausting, 
but successful. And I'm just very happy that I have such great co colleagues to work with in the 33rd district. And we work collaboratively as a team and we get stuff done for our district. We get stuff done for our communities. And that's just so rewarding for all of us, I know. And we wouldn't get it done without you telling us what needs to be done first. So thank you so much for your comments, your suggestions, your criticisms. All of them are useful. And I really appreciate your involvement and participation. Uh, again, this is Tina Orwall. And um, well said, Karen. Uh, we have the best staff in the world. And I just want to thank them so much. And. Uh, it's really one of the highlights of being in Olympia. And I need to also do a shout out to Mary. If you've reached out to my office, you've talked to Mary. And uh, just so such an incredible team. And, you know, these are difficult times. And I just want to say, please don't hesitate to reach out to our office. Uh, so much of our job is to make sure that the government and the state is working uh, to support you and on your behalf. And I agree with Karen, our bill ideas come from the community and I love teaming up on bills. And so uh, right now I'm doing a lot of work on the 988, the three digit behavioral health line. And if you're worried about behavioral health, we have enormous, amazing changes coming. And my office is always available to talk or get your feedback on those changes. So thank you for being here tonight. And it's, it's an honor to do this work. I'd like to use my time to really uh, do a shout out to nonpartisan staff. Um, we have a huge uh, uh, group of folks who are just the, the brains that make sure that the policy bills, the budgetary, the fiscal notes, everything is accurate. Um, and they are nonpartisan staff. And oftentimes they're the faces, they're the names that don't get mentioned. And uh, I just really want to do a huge shout out to them. They really do great work. Yeah, they save our bacon. <laughs> Keep us from making horrible mistakes. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I can say without a shadow of a doubt on behalf of the entire staff that work with you, uh, thank you very much. We really appreciate those words. And, you know, we really enjoy working with you. So it, it kind of goes both ways. Um, people, Great. thank you for joining us. And um, we will see you again next time. Be sure to connect with your legislators. Uh, you'll see the contact info, I think, at the end of this event. If not, you can just go to the House Democrats page or the Senate Democrats page and find the contact info for all, all three of them. Thank you and good night. Good night.